All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, it is great to have everybody here, uh, and it's great to be up here with uh, Peter and Barat. So this is a conversation I've been looking forward to uh, for some time. And part of what's interesting is I think this actually was on the agenda long before a couple of recent articles came out. But those articles nicely, I think, frame up part of the reasons we're having this conversation. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, Curtis wrote an amazing article on the geopolitics of controlling shareholders. It's the Cleary Godley winner for this year. Um, and part of what is really beautiful in that piece is he's illuminating that control, there's an extensive literature on controlling shareholders uh, by many people in this room, most of which focuses on the economics of controlling shareholders, uh, expropriation, the possibility that idiosyncratic vision can be different mechanism, a different mechanism of creating uh, greater value. And his key point is that is actually a small sliver of the ramifications of having controlling shareholders. And if we think about the geopolitical ramifications and the domestic political ramifications, it puts us in much more challenging territory in many regards, but that's the reality that we are living in and have been living in for some time and are going to be living in and that we need to start grappling with if we really want the literature to start to grapple with some of the challenges that we are currently facing. Uh, and he nicely grounds that in a way that I think helps to animate this conversation uh, in the, the literature around the different forms of capitalism. You know, so the turn of this century, uh, we tended to think about it in terms of a relatively simple dichotomy, liberal market economies, coordinated market economies. Uh, and now we have a much richer proliferation of framings around different modes of capitalism for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is we've just seen countries also experiment with modes of capitalism that we didn't previously have. So we look at places like China and Russia really creating new structures of uh, state and market coordination, uh, but also a, a, a greater appreciation that even within those two dichotomies, the reality is they were never two dichotomies. There was a significantly greater heterogeneity all along. Uh, we just didn't label it as such. So you look at a place like the United States, we might have had a certain kind of consensus, a neoliberal consensus that was a paradigm that we were using. But in practice, the state was playing much more of a constitutive role, uh, shaping that structure. And there was an iterative process uh, that was really critical to understanding where we got all along. Um, and I think it's more important now, and it's becoming more important now, partly because in peeling back that veil, it's opening up a different set of conversations, and partly because both the geopolitical moment that we are in, but also because of domestic desires that are being translated through the political process uh, for a different type of economic system are leading to a whole host of different conversations. And so again, the other article that was really interesting that got a lot of traction, not academic at all, uh, was their piece in Foreign Affairs by uh, Peter Orzag and other, he's the current head of Lazard and other senior Lazard officials who had all been former senior Obama officials, basically using as a starting point that if you talk to CEOs and board members, they will say geopolitical risk is the number one thing that they worry about these days. But more importantly, that they see, it was a message to policymakers as much as it was also to government firms, they see the reality going forward as much more of a need for an integrated effort between government and firms to tackle a lot of the domestic and foreign challenges that we're facing. Uh, and so a lot of this conversation is trying to understand, well, what is the, the shift that's actually a feel, afoot? Why are we having that shift? Uh, and, and what is it gonna look like and, and we could not be joined by two better guests. Am I going in and out or is it just me uh, for this conversation? Uh, so to my far right, uh, Bharat Ramamurti. Uh, um, uh, hopefully uh, many of you probably know his great work. He was the deputy director of the NEC with the Biden administration. He's currently a senior economic policy advisor at the American Economics Liberty Project, uh, but has really been at the forefront of the efforts to, to figure out, well, what are the challenges we're facing? What are the best tools? Uh, more on a domestic front, but, but the two are deeply integrated. And of course, one of the environments, one of the ecosystems where the shortcomings of the previous approach that had been embraced became most manifest recently were in supply chain challenges. And it's here where I think it's just out this week how the world ran out of everything. Uh, P so Peter Goodman is a, senior economic correspondent uh, for the New York Times, so you've probably read his work. So he's been at the forefront of, of seeing what's actually happening on the ground for a long period of time. 
And what the book does a great job of exploring is not only the tension that we all saw during COVID, where there had been a focus for a long time on efficiency, and efficiency resulted in greater disaggregation of supply chains, because that resulted in parceling out relatively uh, uh, different parts of the task to relatively lower cost jurisdictions that then actually had a significant drawback on resilience that harmed both firms and also harmed uh, public policy. I mean, we're still dealing with some of the inflation after effects. Uh, but the much deeper issues that are at stake in the structure of supply chains uh, and raising really interesting questions over how we deal with those trade-offs. I'm looking at Jill and thinking about kind of the scope three versus scope two and the gamesmanship. I'm looking at Mark Rowe, thinking about the short-termism, which is part of the efficiency versus resilience uh, trade-off. But of course, there's more to it than that. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter and Barat, who are each going to speak for a little bit. I do want to get as many questions in as possible. Um, I will say Glenn Hubbard was also supposed to be here. We lost him. I think we have a wonderful panel. But I think then it's going to be all the more uh, important to make sure that I, I really create space for questions from the audience. Uh, so please start thinking about what you want to ask. And with that, Peter, maybe I'll turn it over to you first. Super. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. So um, I want to push back on this framing of the trade-off between uh, resilience and efficiency. I mean, I, I, I think we can all pretty much agree that we've lived through this elaborate experiment over a half century. It does seem like the mic is cutting in and out. Can everybody hear? Uh, you know, to see what happens if we uh, embrace this kind of cultish reverence for efficiency combined with deregulation and essentially hand over the building blocks of the modern economy to lightly regulated or not regulated at all in the case of some big industries like shipping, which is basically an international cartel, to profit maximizing uh, public corporations beyond the purview of any real uh, watchdog. And the results are pretty bad. Um, I mean, I think we all recall uh, discovering that we had frontline medical workers going in to deal with uh, COVID patients in the middle of a public health catastrophe, uh, minus uh, the protection they needed because we had entrusted to these very long supply chains and uh, the, the sort of logical outgrowth of profit maximization, sticking all this production in China uh, and pretending that container vessels, you know, they might just as well be down the street, never mind across the Pacific Ocean. That did not work out well. Uh, that was the jumping off point for my book, which traces a single container from Ningbo, China, a factory in Ningbo, China, across the Pacific to the giant floating traffic jam uh, off the ports of LA and Long Beach in the fall of 2021. And then I look at every industry that touched that container along its way from shipping to rail in the US, trucking, uh, warehouses, eventually uh, landing, carrying the most important order in the history of a startup company I focus on, these Elmo-themed bath toys destined for a warehouse in Starkville, Mississippi. Obviously, we ran out of a lot more stuff, uh, a lot more important stuff than uh, Elmo-themed bath toys, uh, medical devices, basic medicines, ventilators. And I think it's fair to say that if you cannot make a ventilator in the richest, most powerful country on earth in the middle of a pandemic, uh, you got a problem with your basic incentives. But I want to get back to what I said at the beginning. This notion that now in our adjustment, we've got to navigate this trade-off between resilience and efficiency. Well, this kind of harrowing journey that I went on, I mean, this book is full of real people stories. I, I rode along with a long-haul truck driver for three days. Uh, I rode with a DRE operator in, in Long Beach. I spent time with uh, traveling uh, maintenance uh, rail crews in, in Texas and, and, uh, and, and other parts of the country. Uh, but what I really took away is there's a lot of inefficiency in this kind of efficiency that we've kind of fetishized. And the obvious example is shipping. So to have a situation where we wake up to discover that Amazon, Walmart, Target, they can pay whatever the going rate is to move containers uh, across the Pacific from factory towns to their biggest markets in, in North America. Uh, and in fact, when shipping prices go up, as they did, you know, tenfold on the spot market in uh, just a few months, 
uh, in the worst part of the pandemic, that's actually an opportunity for them to pick up market share. The monopolists will do what monopolists do. Uh, they'll grab market share and set themselves up for pricing power later. And you know, one of the real costs of the ultra low costs of long supply chains and dependence upon um, countries like China to make our stuff is that we're now, of course, paying higher costs for all sorts of things. And monopoly power is the part that that many economists uh, don't want to talk about because they're just not steeped in market concentration. They prefer to think about supply and demand, which obviously has a lot to say about you know shortages as well. But if you're not dealing with market concentration, you're just simply not looking at the realities of the market. So you know to suddenly have importers discover, well, I've got this piece of paper that says I can move my furniture, apparel, exercise equipment, whatever it is across the Pacific at rates of 5,000, 6,000, 7,000. Uh, per container, and to have giant carriers that are essentially unregulated, that are all foreign, uh, say, oh, sorry, we don't have any room on the ship, unless you pay five times what it says on your piece of paper, and then maybe we do, and maybe you still don't. And then to have that ship pull up and discover, oh, sorry, we don't have a chassis to pull the container uh, out of the port, so it's just going to sit there for weeks at a time. Oh, but Amazon seems to have enough chassis. There's a whole pool of them over there. You can see it at LA Long Beach. We've maximized this supply chain for big box retailers. I spent time with um, almond farmers in the Central Valley, California, who were sitting on an entire crop of sold inventory from the previous year, um, and they couldn't get containers to take their crop to buyers in Japan, in Dubai, because the shipping cartel... I mean, there's three basic alliances that control roughly 95% of the, of the cargo traffic across the Pacific. They were making so much money moving factory goods from Asia to the West Coast of the U.S. And L.A. and Long Beach alone, are that's the gateway for 40% of imported products reaching the United States by container. That instead of unloading the stuff like they usually do, taking some empty containers and sending them by rail or truck, to farmers to load up with almonds, usually at the port of Oakland. They said, forget it. We're just going to unload and then put the empty containers right back on ships and send them back to China as quickly as possible because that's how much money we're making. It justifies burning diesel fuel to send air back across the Pacific as quickly as possible. That's one example. Uh, Just-in-time manufacturing, really smart idea, uh, developed by Toyota at the end of the Second World War. I tell the story in the book of how uh, along comes uh, profit maximization, the consultant class. I spent a lot of time on McKinsey, uh, turning this into this crude imperative. You know, Toyota's idea was instead of just making as much stuff as you possibly can and figuring out how to sell it later, like Ford did at the dawning of mass assembly, let's just make as much as we need to replenish the product we've already sold. Let's get suppliers to do the same thing. They'll deliver the parts and the raw materials we need in real time. You know, great idea. Along come consultancies like McKinsey to say to CEOs of publicly traded companies, this is just an imperative to slash inventory to the bone, take the extra money you used to waste putting parts and raw materials in warehouses as a hedge against some trouble that, yeah, it'll happen eventually, but probably not next quarter, which is all you're worried about. And then give the money to yourself through executive compensation as a reward for being brilliant enough to hire McKinsey or give it to the shareholder through dividends or share buybacks, and everyone will be happy, and eventually something terrible will happen, but by then you'll be you know, on some beach resting in a hammock with a cocktail in your hands, uh, and some other sucker will have to worry about that. And that's essentially how we have run the global economy for decades, and that takes us to, there's a variant of this to get back to this point about how there's inefficiency and efficiency. Look at precision scheduled railroading, which is how the largely monopoly rail operators that dominate cargo traffic in the United States, uh, they've embraced this notion of precision scheduled railroading, which is a fancy word for fire lots of people who used to run railroads, limit the numbers of trains, make the ones that are out there longer than ever, which has all sorts of safety implications. Uh, and then uh, entrust the people who are still working there with doing more work than ever, make their jobs flexible. That's another job, another word that consultants love. It basically means uh, you have no idea when you'll be working. Your family can't count on you. You'll be on the road for longer than ever. You will miss you know, your spouse's birthday, the birth of your children maybe, 
uh, deaths of relatives, and, but suck it up because that's all good for efficiency. And in this context, I was amazed to run into an engineer for Union Pacific uh, out in Idaho who told me that he was routinely pulling freight to the wrong places because precision scheduled railroading had been distilled down to his level as you need to limit dwell time. Wall Street loves lower dwell time. That's the amount of time that a rail car is sitting in a yard at any given time. And if we make dwell time go down, then our share price will go up and our bosses are happy. So this had turned into an imperative at the level of a rail yard in Nebraska to like, whatever the next train is, just stick all the rail on that train, wherever it's going, we'll sort out the rest of it later. So this guy discovered he's pulling a rail car that's, he's, he's pulling a giant train more than a mile long to Oregon. He's got car parts, drums of chemicals that are supposed to be going to California, but he's going the northern route to Oregon to, to limit dwell time. Uh, and of course, at the other end is some factory that's waiting to get these chemicals to make their product, some, uh, some auto manufacturer that's trying to assemble its own parts out of the parts that are on the way. That's pretty inefficient. And by the way, the shareholders getting ripped off in that scenario, because um, while the people running monopoly rail companies are interested in quarter for quarter, they're treating Wall Street like they're suckers when they basically undermine their operational capacity uh, in order to just cater to one simple metric. Uh, I'll tell you one other quick story and then uh, move it along. Um, I, I tell the story in the book of how McKinsey had a group that was so dedicated to just in time that they called themselves the Lean Taliban. And um, I interviewed a guy who was on the receiving end of the Lean Taliban's wrath at this industrial engine company, eventually bought by Cummins uh, in Minnesota. And he told me how you know, he was sitting there, 20-year veteran, Minnesota business school degree, a lot of common sense. And in come the guys from McKinsey, these you know, mostly young, slick-suited, recent Ivy League graduates led by one older guy from the Chicago office. And they sat this guy down and said, you know, you're doing it all wrong. Your, your, your warehouse is full of these $5 sheet metal brackets. You got to get rid of those. You can save a lot. You, you, you got to empty out the warehouse. And he said, but just in time, like talk about just in time. I mean, we're making giant industrial generators that require cranes to install at hospitals. If we don't nail that delivery date right there, that, that's a serious problem. Well, the lean Taliban won. And this factory found itself spending hundreds of thousands of extra dollars on emergency shipments in order to um, make up for the fact that they had a warehouse that didn't have enough $5 sheet metal brackets. That's not very efficient. And, you know, finally, I'll just say, as somebody told me for the book, that whatever your sense of efficiency is, if you can't make a ventilator in a wealthy country in the middle of COVID-19, uh, you don't get to say, well, at least our share price is high. And that that is fundamentally the problem that we're dealing with. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a feeling you might be experiencing flashbacks here. Uh, but with that, let's turn it over to Barat. Uh, thanks, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, a lot of, uh, of personal trauma uh, described in those moments. You know, as as Kate mentioned, I was uh, in the White House from 2021 to 2023, and so um, was on the uh, on the hook in many cases for dealing with some of these things. In, uh, many many late night calls with folks at the ports of LA and Long Beach to talk about the multiple mile long queue of uh, boats that were uh, waiting uh, to come get processed by uh, by through the port. Um, you know, remember some very uh, challenging days dealing with a baby formula shortage, which some of you may remember, um, and uh, and trying to negotiate with uh, folks in Europe and, and United Airlines to try to get them to transport European formula uh, in the bed uh, of the have a passenger jet in order to get uh, uh, stuff on shelves. So, um, you know, I was I think just to add to what Peter was saying. You know, in my mind, there's really been these two converging trends, basically starting in the late 70s or early 80s, towards a much more fragile U.S. economy. Right, number one in the late 70s and early 80s is when you see the the rise of the the, the concept of shareholder value maximization, 
Um, obviously, it's not the case that before that firms didn't care about shareholder value or profits, but uh, the sort of maniacal focus on quarterly return um, led in many in many ways to uh, the idea that we need to cut costs to the bone just in time. Uh, low inventory models that were again about making sure that the amount that was returned to shareholders quarterly was as large as possible. And I think the second uh, trend that emerged at roughly the same time was a, a significant relaxation of antitrust enforcement in the United States, which led to, you know, according to many studies, significant consolidation in, in most U.S. industries over the last 30 or so years. And so what you have as a result is a situation in many uh, industries where there are at best a handful of large competitors, not a more diverse array of competitors, all of whom are desperately trying to deliver shareholder value and running things as uh, you know as leanly as possible, so that when there is any kind of disruption, and of course COVID and COVID reopening was a massive disruption, um, there's simply not enough flexibility in the marketplace to uh, to avoid really catastrophic results. So again, to add to the examples, I remember. Uh, you know, meat processing, highly concentrated industry. There's probably, you know, for for uh, for beef, for pork, you know, two or three, depending on the exact market. Uh, you know, mega corporations that do meat processing, and for individual producers across the country, oftentimes they only have one choice in their region to deal with. And so, you know, what we saw in 2021 and 2022 was that there were some disruptions in the meat processing industry. You know, a, a, a major plant was shut down because of potential um, labor violations and also uh, cost, you know, uh, contamination issues. You know, that led to a nationwide increase in the cost of, uh, of meat products. Um, you had oil and gas pipelines, same issue. We had a pipeline shut down in the southern part of the United States because of a cybersecurity incident. Uh, you know, there was no capacity to, to step in to fill that. We had to figure out a way of getting trucks to, to ship uh, oil and gas to avoid, you know, $10 gas uh, in, in the southern part of the United States. You know, why did we have that uh, uh, baby formula shortage in the United States? It's because uh, Abbott, uh, which makes most of the baby formula in the United States, makes 40% of its uh, formula at a single plant in Michigan, which got shut down because of a contamination issue. And all of a sudden, you know, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, you know, Colorado, there were no, there was no specialty formula on the shelves, and no capacity to bring online to, to substitute for that. And so, you know, obviously, we dealt a lot in the short term with how do we resolve this crisis and get things where they need to be. But part of our mandate was also to think about you know, how do we um, make sure this kind of stuff doesn't happen again, or at least reduce the risk of it happening. Because the 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 confluence of these two trends is really an offloading of a significant amount of risk onto the public, right? That it is a transfer of risk from uh, companies and shareholders to the public. And, um, and, and, to, and to my mind, there are really two categories of solutions, right? You um, could have the government as a backstop uh, for some of these types of disruptions. And you know, we, we have an example of that. We have the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, right? We have determined that oil isn't critical enough to the US economy, that the government should have on standby a significant amount, uh, of, you know, hundreds of millions of barrels of oil to um, offset a potential disruption of supply. But you know, that's not a really sustainable or, or replicable solution, right? As I, I would joke, it's not very funny, but I would still joke, uh, you know, we don't have a strategic bacon reserve. But we could have used one, you know, in 2022 when um, there was a significant disruption in the meat processing industry. We, we believe it or not, we do have a strategic cheese reserve, um, but um, but it's not a model that we can replicate across the economy. So then the alternative is, um, as the uh, how how should the government uh, intervene to to uh, put pressure against the shareholder value maximizing model and say um, you have an obligation to build in some amount of resilience into your business model, right? And so with, with baby formula, you know, an idea that we had was to say to a, a, a large company, you cannot have more than X percentage of your production at a, at a single site, so that if that site is shut down for whatever reason, you at least have the capacity to use one of your other five or six sites, right? Now, none, almost none of these proposals got enacted into law. The one, example, one exception was on ocean shipping where 
uh, you know, we worked and, and, and had the President of the United States call for a reform uh, in the 2022 State of the Union, and Congress, believe it or not, was able to pass a law that actually put in place new regulations that a, a little bit helped um, address some of the, the anti-competitive issues and to build in a bit more uh, uh, resiliency into, into the ocean shipping industry. But it's not something that we were successful in doing um, in, in many other industries. And so, uh, to me, the uh, we've learned a lot of lessons from COVID and the strain that it put on supply chains and has exposed some of the, the weaknesses in our current model of corporate governance in the United States, but I don't think we've solved many of them. On that cheerful note, um, I do want to open up for questions, but I do want to follow up a little bit. I, I really appreciated, Peter, early on, you pushed back on the notion that there's a trade-off, and you're like, actually, some of the trade-off is just that we're measuring efficiency wrong, uh, and there's incredible inefficiencies. Um, but I do wonder if there are trade-offs that, that need to be put out there just so we can grapple with them. And this, so when I look at what's going on right now in DC, I see two different trends and maybe I'm wrong in thinking there's a possibility they move in different directions. Um, one is, one of the ways we've gone wrong is allowing excessive concentration. We need much more diffuse economic opportunity and much broader economic opportunity. And we certainly see that in my field in banking where there's far more scrutiny of bank mergers and where in some ways, again, it's just returned to history where we used to actually have a much more regulated uh, design in terms of the structure of the banking system as a way of trying to facilitate broader access to capital to promote uh, a broader structure of flourishing. Uh, and then there is the current geopolitical environment uh, where suddenly the government really does want to use sanctions in a very uh, critical way to further particular aims and where their capacity to do so is at times enhanced. Uh, if you have slightly greater concentration, greater technology, greater possibility, of cooperation, um, and I just wonder if either of you have any thoughts, because it's an issue, those are dynamics that are really both present in the supply chain story. I mean, part of what was really interesting about the supply chain story you're telling is, is that there's multiple different values that have been compromised, um, and there's ways to make meaningful progress, and I think Barat just laid out some of them, but, but I wonder if you have any thoughts of, as we start to acknowledge the inherent interdependence that has been downplayed in some of the existing paradigms, uh, whether there are trade-offs, where you see them, and maybe you see different trade-offs, but like where you see them and what, how, how you think about balancing them. Uh, yeah, sure, there are some trade-offs. I mean, multinational companies that ran out of product, even uh, ones that registered uh, historic profits and celebrated that as a result because of their pricing power, are looking to diversify away from heavy, heavy dependence on Chinese factories. Some of that is shipping. Some of that is the Trump, now Biden tariffs on exports uh, from China and the anticipation that whatever happens in November, you know, that's permanent and animosity probably gets worse. I mean, I'll give, I'll give you a very concrete example. You know, 15 years ago, if you flew into Bentonville, Arkansas to go pitch Walmart on how to get your product from your factory onto the shelves of a superstore. You have to go to Bentonville, they don't go to you, it's like going to see the Pope. Uh, you get your appointment, you give your little pitch, and then they would ask you, where are you making this product? And if the answer was somewhere other than China, you had a problem because the assumption was you weren't getting the lowest cost, you couldn't possibly make, be making it at the most efficient scale. And now, in the same conversation, where are you making this product, if the answer is only China, you have a problem. Uh, they're still going to make a lot, a lot of stuff in China. China's still got this unbeatable combination of scale, highly skilled workers, even though the costs are going up. The tariffs are definitely a problem. China's own internal policies are a serious variable for multinational companies from the, you know, zero COVID restrictions to the abrupt lifting of zero COVID restrictions. But it's, it's still an unbeatable combination. But there is a, you know, I just came back from two weeks in India where uh, Walmart is now uh, in the process of tripling their sourcing of products from India. They have a goal of $10 billion uh, to serve the American market by 2027. You know, that's a real thing. Some of those products will be more expensive along. I mean, Walmart's not gonna tolerate that for long. They'll, they'll tolerate that in the immediate term to get it going in the name of resilience, but again, to this, point of how we're framing the terms of resilience versus uh, efficiency, what is the cost 
of not being able to satisfy demand for a medical device in real time. What is the cost of, you know, Ford at the River Rouge factory, Henry Ford's monument to self-sufficiency and mastering the supply chain, making F-150 pickup trucks, as I saw when I walked the catwalk in early 2022, and then taking the finished vehicles and literally parking them in the shadow of Ford's corporate headquarters across the street from Henry Ford Elementary School while waiting for the chips to come in from an island that happens to be 90 miles off the coast of China that China claims is part of its own territory and that not incidentally we're having a trade war you know, with. Well, what, what's the cost of that reliance? And, and so we cannot count on profit-maximized publicly traded companies that are still hugely focused on the immediate quarter to solve this problem. There's going to have to be, you know, changes in consumer behavior, though I don't put a lot of stock in the idea that consumers are all going to become supply chain geeks. Or gonna, so I mean, we're all busy raising our children and getting to work, and you, we're not going to fix this. Uh, but I do have some hope that investors may get clued into the fact that, again, you know, not to retell the story of precision scheduled railroading, but they're getting ripped off. Uh, they're getting short-term gain for long-term loss of the reliability of rail. And I do just have to add to something that Barat said that's hugely important about uh, meat packers. You know, competition policy has to be at the center of this because, you know, the, the, the classical economic notion is, Okay, uh, supply is constrained, demand's going up. Well, new market entrants will cook up more of the things we're missing. Not if 85% of the meatpacking capacity is controlled by four companies, the biggest of which is run by two convicted felons from Brazil who borrowed the money to buy up the slaughterhouses in the United States. And I tell the story of a woman who died working in that slaughterhouse when the Trump administration uh, issued an executive order to keep the slaughterhouses going in the middle of the pandemic parroting industry talking points that if they didn't keep the slaughterhouses going and contravene local public health regulations saying they should be shut down as COVID spreaders, we would all run out of meat. We'd all be hungry. And they, you have to keep going there uh, and working there in danger and risk your life because otherwise we'll go hungry. Well, at the time, we subsequently found out the meat packers were sitting on record quantities of frozen meat and we're exporting this product around the world. So we kill the slaughterhouse workers, not for resilience and feeding. Or we did it to funnel monopoly profits to shareholders. And if we don't deal with that, then we the whole question of efficiency and resiliency, like, forget the trade-off. It's just a fantasy. Yeah, I think that there's... Um you know, I, I keep coming back to the question: like, What are we, what are we doing all of this for, <laughs> right? And uh, and and I always go back to the fact that um, you know the corporation exists uh, as a grant, as a privilege from the state. You know, a corporate charter. The reason a corporation exists, and of course, going back to the old days, um, there would be sort of one-off decisions on whether to grant a corporate charter or not. But essentially, what the state is doing is saying we are giving you certain privileges. Right, and on legal liability and, and, and other things, because we believe that you, this corporation, are going to deliver something that's valuable to the public. And, um, and so I think over, uh, over time, of course, this has become kind of mechanical and getting a charter is, much, is more, more simple and so on. But the point is, um, you know, the corporation exists to deliver uh, value to the public. And, um, and I think, you know, the only, per the only actor in this drama right now that can um, ensure that at the end of the day, the outcomes are, are best for the public, I think, is the government, right? I think counting on investors to do that, especially in dealing with some of these issues on resiliency and fragility and so on, is a mistake because, you know, if there's a serious problem in a certain industry, time after time after time, the, the government will step in and solve it, bail, it, bail out the, bail those folks out, right? You know, the uh, two times in the last two decades, the airline industry has had issues post 9-11 and then during COVID. You know, collectively the government gave the airline industry about $100 billion between those two situations to keep the airlines uh, up and running. So, you know, why would the airlines uh, value, you know, making sure that they had some money set aside to deal with some lean times in air traffic uh, and so on? There's, there's no reason for them to do that because they know that the taxpayers will step in and save them uh, if things get really hairy. So. And if you're an investor, you're not going to invest in the, in the airline that tries to be 
forward looking and say, we should be planning for a downturn in demand because we'll survive that, but our competitors won't, and you should invest in us for that reason. Of course not. Uh, you know That would be stupid because you're leaving profits on the table uh, if you're doing that and, and you're discounting the fact that the government will step in and help you. So I, I don't believe in the idea that investors are going to, sort of the market will solve for this problem by valuing companies that are more forward looking and, and, and value resilience more. You know, to me, the, the answer is, uh, you know, the government needing to be thoughtful, you know, I, I, I acknowledge that, you know, that, uh, you know, planning for a once in a generation pandemic um, is a challenging endeavor for, for a business. But it's on, and that comes with certain costs. You don't want companies to have, you know, massive stockpiles of everything in case something happens to go wrong. But, you know, it feels clearly to me like the balance that we have now is not the correct one. And so, you know, uh, in in areas that are particularly important, you know, maybe we don't care about the the immediate supply of low cost T shirts to Americans, right? But we should care about the immediate availability of uh, specialty baby formula that babies can't live with without if they don't get it, right? We should care about food. We should care about medical devices. Uh, so, what are we going to do in those industries to make sure that? You know, firms that otherwise do not care about this in a sort of public sense uh, are forced to care about it. And how do we do that in a way that ultimately, you know, because I think this should be our goal, minimizes the long-term cost uh, on the corporation and the people that it employs in order to accomplish those goals? All right, I see Jeff already jumping jumping ahead, so I'll go ahead and jump in with Jeff and then turn to others. Yeah, um, the issue of. Uh, how do we insure against um, special sorts of tail risk is obviously a difficult one. Um, and so I just want to follow up in some specific way. So um, one of the issues that COVID revealed is that uh, the hospitals basically are at 100% um, capacity, right? Um, and uh, that reduces medical costs for everyone, including the Medicare costs for the government. So we could say uh, the hospitals ought to run at 85% capacity precisely to provide um, resiliency in the case of, um, in the case of uh, you know, a pandemic. But the issue is, of course, who's going to pay for that? And um, it's hard to think that the government isn't better equipped to cover those costs. So that's going to be a very significant in, in, in increase, however, in you know, Medicare costs, et cetera. Um, so, so it's not so, the idea of imposing those costs on the hospitals throughout the United States, which is essentially in an immediate way to increase the medical costs for everyone, you know, I'm not sure that's specific, specifically the way to go. Second example, we tried resiliency when it came to, to, uh, to uh, the vaccines. Uh, the, the, bold, the Baltimore plant that the government built precisely to build a va vaccine was not one that could, could be used. It was, you know, uh, the contamination from the day one meant it was never used. So basically, there's an effort we tried to anticipate resiliency, and we failed. As it was, um, you know, basically, we counted on pharma. We counted on big pharma to provide the resiliency, and that seemed to work. A third example right today is the failure of um, generic drugs, right? And so we've set up a reimbursement system which means it makes economic sense for only one party to produce many generic drugs. So, you know, these are three different examples which show that planning, that it's fine to say we need resiliency, but planning for resiliency is expensive, who's going, going to pay, and B, it's not so easy to figure out, uh, I mean, to do it correctly in advance, and then C, in government policy, we actively are now work, working against resiliency in important areas. Yeah, look, I, I think that um, these are, and I, I hope I didn't diminish this, I think these are extremely hard questions with very clear trade-offs. You know, I think on, on cost, my, my, my one point on cost is that more often than not, we end up paying at some point in the process. <laughs> 
because if there's if we haven't imposed the cost on an ongoing basis more often than not, that means that in one fell swoop we pay very high costs uh, when there's a true emergency uh, and there isn't you know enough resiliency in the system and the government needs to step in at those uh, at those moments and you know because of the kind of um, you know last minute nature of it. It may be more expensive. It also may mean that uh, because of a delay that there's really severe consequences, either medical consequences or, or whatever. So, um, you know, number two, yeah, I completely agree. I think that in many cases, um, you know, structures that the government has set up to uh, sort of provide as fail safe in the system haven't worked very well. You know, I think that, um, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the benefits of private sector competition is that there are multiple firms that are spend all day, every day, trying to figure out how to be better at what they're trying to do. And, uh, and that gives them an edge in many areas over, uh, over the government. Um, and so, you know, to me, it comes back to um, a real, uh, placing a real emphasis on competition, because um, if you have truly competitive markets uh, with, you know, a number of, of very good, uh, good firms, um, that sort of naturally gives you uh, a more capacity to deal with uh, unexpected uh, occurrences. Um, I think again, that's co sort of consistent with the the you know the early 20th century uh, uh, antitrust laws that were passed, which were basically saying, you know, put a thumb on the scale towards having more competitors rather than fewer competitors in in markets because there's all sorts of benefits to that. Um, and the other thing is that we need to invest more in in government expertise and capacity. <laughs> you know, I think. Um, uh, uh, Congress, the White House, there's a real um, hesitancy for political reasons to say um, we should pay more. We should pay more for building up government capacity. We should uh, we should pay better salaries so we can att attract real experts into the government. We should you know have certain departments or agencies or divisions um, who basically aren't called upon to do something for ten years, but then in that moment. 11 years from now, they're going to be really important, and it's important that they be really good at their job. You know, those are the kinds of things, having been in a number of these government funding disputes, those are the first things to get cut, always. And over time, the government's capacity to do extraordinarily complicated things on the technological side has been, uh, has been really hollowed out. There used to be an Office of Technology Assessment that was really valuable to providing Congress with ideas on. Um, on these types of thorny questions, you know, that got defunded during, you know, the the Newt Gingrich era, and the Contract for America. So, um, you know, to to have better government performance, you need to invest in the government just like you would uh, in everything else. But again, I think it's the the the, the return on that uh, investment will be significant. Uh, two quick things on healthcare specifically: the cost issue is a total red herring. I mean, we we took a third of the hospital rooms offline in the 20 years running up to the pandemic. Where did the money go? It went to profit-making healthcare companies and de facto profit-making through nonprofit, through share buybacks, through executive compensation. We're, we live in a country where one out of every three emergency room doctors is employed by two companies controlled by two private equity companies, including Blackstone. The money's going to executives. It's going to the investor class. We have essentially transferred the, co the money that we used to spend on services into the hands of the investor class. We can certainly afford healthcare, even for a once in a lifetime pandemic. But this idea that more broadly in terms of the supply chain, we're just talking about these you know, crazy things that hardly ever happen. How do we build a supply chain for something that only happens every hundred years? You know, we have shocks all the time. I mean, the first supply chain story I ever wrote was back in 1999 where there was an earthquake in Taiwan and that knocked the semiconductor industry down and we had shortages for months after. Uh, a bunch of other shocks. The landmark is 2012, you know, the Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan. Lots of people said then, oh, we've really overdone it with just in time as we had shortages of critical electronics. Uh, for, for years after. Uh, there was a book that came out, a couple of Oxford academics wrote a book called The Butterfly Defect in 2014 that predicted that a pandemic would be the thing that would really bring supply chains down. There'd be financial implications. And you know this was all known, but we tuned it out because what we had was great for the investor class. And you think about, I mean, we got the CHIPS Act, which is many people think a very useful piece of industrial policy. Uh, that's adjusting to the geopolitical realities and the, the problems, again, of entrusting Taiwan with, with our semiconductor supply. 
How much money, you know, did Intel spend on buybacks in the three years before the CHIPS Act? Roughly what it would cost to build the fab that they're building now in the United States. Roughly what it's costing Taiwan Semiconductor to build a fab in Phoenix. So most of the time when we say, oh, we can't possibly afford that, what we're really saying is we don't want to take the money from the people who've already won. And those are the people who are running large publicly traded corporations. We don't tax rich people in America the way they do in most of the rest of the developed world. That's really the crux of most of our problems. Yeah, yeah. Just, just wondering a bit about the role of regulation in creating some of these uh, uh, lack of resilience. So I think like a couple of the examples you just mentioned. So the uh, the ports. Uh, there was a lot, if I remember correctly, there was a lot of they kind of walked back a lot of regulations to uh, to facilitate uh, working longer hours, et cetera, et cetera, at the port, or it, with the uh, the baby formula. Uh, I think you weren't allowed to ship, uh, to take European baby formula and bring it to the US. Uh, and we had to change that. If those rules didn't exist in the first place, uh, I, I don't think this is the whole solution, but I do think it's a non-trivial, I mean, we constantly saw during the pandemic kind of occupational licensing for nurses uh, being, being, uh, being relaxed uh, to deal with nursing shortages. So, and that at least is one thing that the government can address directly as opposed to, uh, you know, wanting corporations to be something different. One more question and then response. I want to echo what, uh, what just mentioned. There seems to be a parallel between what Peter, you're talking about and what Bart, you're talking about. I think there's a pressure from the shareholders calling for a lean firm, like you try to squeeze out all the so-called fat so that you can maximize the profit. At the same time, I think, Barry, you're talking about there's also a pressure from the voters, maybe, to call for a lean government. You want to you know, get rid of all these uh, you know, uh, extra capacities. But that actually goes against the resilience of the system. This is also uh, an issue about the moral hazard, I think, that, Barry, you were talking about. It seems that the firms, when facing all these constraints, they're trying to kind of, you know, they, they, don't, they can't afford to, to be forward-looking. They actually, you know, shirk on some of the responsibilities they be, should be taken and then put it towards the government, but then in order to be profit maximization, but then the government faces this moral hazard problem of the firms. If you bail out those guys who are actually shirking, then it's gonna cause all other firms to shirk even more on their responsibilities. But I guess isn't that exactly the purpose of us talking about corporate governance instead of corporate Finance, if you think about corporate finance as the single dimension maximization of just the shareholder value, whereas the corporate governance is exactly trying to deal with this multi-dimensional problem, you're not just dealing with one specific stakeholder, the shareholder. You're actually also dealing with the employees, the community, the government, the environment, so on and so forth. So there's actually a whole host of these objectives. You're trying to maximize at the same time through cop governance rather than corporate finance. So how can we, I mean, this audience, actually think about better ways to actually deal with this problem or maybe to put it in other words, somehow to internalize those so-called externalities that we're talking about so that we can make sure that incentives from within the firm is more aligned with incentives outside of the firms. Right. Yeah. Um, two really good questions on that. Oh, okay. So um, the regulatory question, uh, you know, I'll be the first to admit that, it, you, know, um, you know, large it, large incumbent firms, one of their most potent uh, tools for protecting their competitive position uh, is to use the regulatory process to write rules that uh, protect them from competition. And, um, you know, and that's why, you know, one of the things that uh, I worked on in, in government was the president's executive order on competition and the creation of a competition council and, and basically the idea, the mandate to agencies that in the same way that you think about the budgetary cost of your decisions, you think about cost benefit analysis in terms of what's the cost to the regulated industry, you have to be thinking about what are the competitive impacts of your decisions, right? And, um, and you know, we made some progress in, in, in areas to, to address exactly those types of regulatory barriers you talked about, you know, one of the things um, I was I, I worked on when I worked in, in the Senate for Senator Warren uh, from Massachusetts, and then in the administration, 
was uh, changing the rules so that hearing aids can be sold over the counter rather than uh, only through a specialist. You know, so now you can walk into a CVS or a Best Buy and buy a pair of hearing aids. That didn't used to be the case uh, before we changed these rules, and now hearing aids cost several hundred dollars instead of, on average, $5,000 a pair. And so um, I, I think it's critically important that uh, the idea that all government regulation is public serving and, and pro-competition is obviously wrong. <laughs> and I think certain administrations do a better job of avoiding those traps than others. But, um, but you know, we, we should take a very hard look at the regulatory apparatus that we have to make sure are we actually solving for resilience or are we not? And if we're not, you know, what, again, cost benefit, what is the value that we are protecting and is it worth sacrificing resilience in order to pursue this, right? So, you know, I think some of the stuff on, on labor and so on, that's not efficiency maximizing. It's anti-resilience, but it's important because we don't want workers getting their hands sliced off working at unsafe uh, meat processing facilities. You know, to, to your question about uh, corporate governance, you know, I, the way I always think about it is that there is, um, you know, I spent a little time looking at the B Corp movement, right? The idea that there should be corporations that explicitly say in their charters, you know, we are, we are valuing things other than shareholder value, right? We, we care about the communities that we operate in, we care about the environment, we care about the suppliers that we're working with and so on. And so, you know, some firms um, have voluntarily adopted this structure because it's consistent with their brand and they have a pocket of investors that are that are interested in it. But you know, it's not something that has taken hold uh, nationally. And there's obviously kind of a first mover disadvantage in all of this because if you're the first firm to say, we care less about m making money, <laughs> well, what are your investors gonna do? They're gonna go to your competitor because as an investor, you care about making money. Um, again, unless you love Patagonia and you love what they stand for as a company and you're willing to take a financial uh, hit because of that. So, um, you know, again, that, that's why it, it seems to me like there's a strong case, and of course a lot of corporate law happens at the state level, so maybe the federal government is not, not the solution, but there's a very strong case in my mind for uh, some kind of rethinking about the baseline uh, goals of the corporation, right? And not to say that they should ignore profit making because there are you know, valuable things that come from the desire to produce a better product at a lower price. But, um, but how do we deal with, um, uh, how do we address some of these broader issues like resilience, like, you know, the effect on the environment, like the uh, effect on the climate, that um, where it probably makes sense for the corporation to be thinking about some of these concerns. And, um, uh, and, and, and no individual corporation is likely to do something meaningful in that space if it comes at the cost of, of uh, lower investor returns because that's not the design of the corporation <laughs> currently. Uh, I, you know, I think it's a very thorny problem because you don't, again, I, I think that there are, there's a lot of value that's generated by the system that we have now, but, uh, but very, uh, to me, again, it's a pendulum and I think the pendulum has swung too far in one direction away from sort of the public serving nature of corporations, you know, ultimately the goal of the corporation should be to deliver public value. Briefly, uh, no matter how many times the World Economic Forum and the Business Roundtable, just to pick on them uh, randomly, tell us that we're living in the era of stakeholder capitalism, we are very much still living in Milton Friedman's era. Uh, and uh, when you're making policy, I assume you have to deal with that reality that publicly traded companies are thinking about their fiduciary responsibilities. And that's not wrong. And we get we do get a lot of value out of that. But we should be sober minded in understanding that we can't outsource problems with competition, with climate change, with racial and gender imbalance. I mean, to pick the sort of obvious ones, uh, we, we got to use democracy and our own representative government to actually have a say about how some things will go that will not be addressed uh, by the market. And it, I mean, if you look at the port, sure, there's bad, I mean, to echo what Barat said, there's good regulations, there's bad regulations, you have to ask who's writing the regulations for what purpose, what's the money behind it, what's the goal. You know, if, if you look specifically at the port, why were the ports not operating 24 seven? Because a lot of people live near the ports at Southern California, it's very dense, they don't want trucks coming through at all hours of the day. You know, Biden and his, uh, his port czar, John 
Macquarie come out and they do this great photo op. We're going to go 24 7. We're going to move this stuff in and out of the port. Well, first of all, they have no ability to make that happen because the warehouses that the trucks are delivering stuff to, they're not going 24 7. They don't want to hire new shifts and security guards. So it sounded good, but it was never really going to happen. And they knew that when, when they said it. But also, to, to reinforce this idea that competition policy really matters, who's running the ports? The ports are landlord models. Los Angeles and Long Beach lease out terminals to the shipping carriers themselves. The shipping carriers, Maersk, Costco, MSC, they are the ones actually operating these ports that can't handle all this freight and somehow that's just coincidentally making freight go up tenfold and they're celebrating record profits. You know, ask yourself this. If like you had to pay 10 times as much to get your ticket that takes you from New York to Chicago to actually get on the plane because there's a snowstorm uh, that's shutting the airport down and it turns out that the airline itself is running the snow plows, how incentivized would they be to get the tarmacs cleared off if they can charge you 10 times as much to get on the plane. That was the situation in the shipping industry. It really comes down to competition policy. Can I add one more thing, which is, you know, the alternative to all of these regulatory outcomes um, is just a much more robust tax code, right? And it's to say, we're not going to mess with how you run your firms, okay? We decided you guys know best, profit maximization on a quarterly basis, still produces a ton of value. Having the government come in and tell you to, to value other things is either, you know, net negative in terms of efficiency um, or, you know, uh, or the government doesn't know better than you about how to, how to do these things. Well, then, you know, then we need a much broader capacity, like I said, option one, for the government to be able to fill in the gaps and deal with the risks that that model uh, creates. And, but of course, we're going in the wrong direction on that, right? You know, this, the corporate tax rate in the United States was 35%. Trump cut it to 21%. I saw yesterday he wants to cut it even further. So, you know, the amount of revenue that the United States government is bringing in from corporations, even as they have had been very profitable, has been steadily moving downwards as a percentage of GDP. And so, you know, at a minimum, we need to, either we need to reverse that trend and say, we are going to have a strategic banking reserve uh, with all this corporate tax revenue so that if there are, you know, screw ups in the meat processing industry, you know, American consumers aren't going to suffer. Um, or, uh, or we need to pursue a regulatory approach. And, you know, I think there, there are costs to both. Part of what's hard about governing is trying to think through uh, those types of trade-offs. And then ultimately, and I think this is always good to remind people, you, you have to think about politically what's feasible, right? Is it more feasible to say to somebody, we're going to really up the taxation in the United States in order to create, you know, uh, fill in some of the gaps in the economy? Or is it easier to say to people, we're going to put in, set, in place a new set of regulations that force corporations to consider other values other than just making the most amount of profits. You know, I legitimately don't know which one of those is more politically feasible. All right, well, I'm sure there's more questions, but we are out of time. So join me in thanking our panelists.